<laughs> and hello, Jagamara. Here we go again. <laughs> yeah, take take two. <laughs> Everything That's... that was done before is erased, so we're going to start from scratch. I just want to say again, thank you. And uh, I've been uh, attending some of your training classes and, and learning a lot. And I'm very excited about some of the sovereignty things that you're talking about. And the prophecy stuff really fascinates me as well. So I'm going to let you do most of the talking. I'm not going to interrupt you. I'll hold up fingers or something. Hopefully the video and everything will, the, con the connection will remain good throughout the talk. We're going to go about 30 to 40 minutes maybe. No and, worries. Uh, no. I want I want you to share your heart because you brought me to tears more than once with some of the things that you share. I'm really excited to have uh, this conversation with you. As I said, though, it's going to be mostly you doing the talking and wetting people's appetite on what's going on from your from your eyes and your heart and what you perceive. Oh, where is it all, mate? Well, I'll start by saying thank you very much, my brother from another mother. It is our job to put this information out. You are, you do what you have been put on this earth to do, and I do the same. It's only when we come together and come with other like-minded beings, we get to see the beauty in ourselves by seeing how others see us. Because when we look in the mirror, we don't see the same as others see. So it's good to be able to do what we do best so others can see us shine. A lot of this, um, this information that I share is made up from all over the planet. It's um it's what's been collected over many, many years, uh, by the group, the One Heaven group, um, Franka Collins and uh UPU Universal Poster Union information, um, also um Bill Turner information. And it's I found it's the thing that feeds the soul. Food and drink will feed the body to allow it to survive. But the thing that feeds the soul is knowledge. Clear, clean knowledge. When we deliver this to the soul within each vessel, we find that by them hearing it and being witness, you see the spirit inside move within them. And you know, they know the truth. Even if it's the first time I've ever heard it before, they know it when they hear it. This is dream dust. Dream dust is knowledge. When you cast a pebble into the pond, the ripples expand. That's what happens when you cast knowledge into the mind. The ripples expand. From getting the first uh, bit of information makes you ask questions. And those questions lead you to answers, which lead you to more questions, which lead you to more answers. So it becomes this cycle. Sovereignty is its a word that's been bastardized for many, many years, as we would all know. There's many people over the planet claim to be gurus of sovereign, and many people say this is the only way, and so on. Sovereignty is in your heart. Sovereignty is not just in your head. Sovereign capacity is the ability to know who you are, ability to know how you need to behave as a sovereign being. Behavior is what makes everyone around us in this planet judge us, depending on what we say and depending on what we do, because they're the only things they can witness. They can judge what we hear, but they have no idea how we feel about it until we speak it or until we enact it out by our behavior. So, this whole thing about um, sovereignty, we are the consciousness, we're the divine being. And the conscious, the divine being, is the sovereign over the body, for it is the ultimate authority over our body. It controls what we think, say, and do. If anyone is to say that they own our body, have the right to control it, then ask them, please control what I think, say, and do better than I can. If you can't, sit down and shut up. That's the first thing. Now, once you start understanding personalities, because your soul part, your, your life force is the soul, is the spirit, but you have many personalities. 
many people see themselves like a car or a vessel with uh, one driver and just one personality. That's not so at all. Personality you are when you're with your mum is not the same personality when you're with your kids, not the same personality when you're with your lover, not the same personality when you're with your friends. Carry on going out and drinking and carrying on. They're all different personalities, but they all reside within the same vessel. So see yourself more like a bus or a train, and every seat is full. Because look at every single state of mind, whether you be happy, sad, drunk, stoned, they're all different personalities. Every time you step into another environment, you create another personality unless you take one in with you. And you'll find that personality will be driven and will be created by the environment. So what you live, you will learn. What you learn, you will practice. What you practice, you will become. So the last thing you want to do is copy the behavior of idiots when you can see they're idiots. You know, the end result of that behavior is just going to make you look like them. Idiots. So knowing this should give us an outline or simply the first <coughs> uh, line to draw on the sand. If I'm going to test something or become some or practice something, have a look at the end result of it before I start studying it. Because the last thing you want to do is say, oh, I want to do this for money, I want to do this and do all of this with predications of, oh, this is what's going to make me money. And this is what's going to make me successful and turn out, turns you into an arsehole. And no one wants to work you and do anything with you anyway because no one can deal with your personality. So it doesn't matter how much knowledge we hold. People will still walk away from us. Yeah? If by you have the wrong motive, yes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so by understanding who we are and understanding what we're here for, and what we're here to do. Because it comes down to, when you look at whatever anyone does, does, myself or anyone else, the first thing people should ask is, okay, who is this? Want to know who it is? What are they talking about? Next thing is, do they know what they're talking about? Next thing is, well, in order to know these three things, I better have a look in other areas of the field that they are talking about, see whether they're talking truth or shit. That's just common sense. Now, after finding that out, whether you can find out these people actually know truth or sense, or just baffling with bullshit and dazzling with brilliance, or someone just mix the two together and think you don't see the difference. Yeah? And that's what we call the cutting and pasting style. Many people say, oh, I know the law, you just got to use this piece of paper, blah, blah, blah. But the law is not paper. The law is spoken. You are a law holder. When you know the law, you hold the law. When you speak it out, you're preserving the law. When you, once you speak it, it can be inaugurated because someone has to hear it for them to record it. Once it's inaugurated on paper, it can be taken to a court or anywhere else or whatever you want to do with the piece of paper. But the law is not the piece of paper. It's not the words on the piece of paper. That's just cargo on a paper vessel known as words. And it's nothing but cargo if you don't understand what it means. People can say, oh, I'm the occupant of the office of the general executive of the Gary Summer State. Cool. Tell me what it means. Um, don't mean shit. Yeah, I had an experience where I helped a friend by preparing papers, and then when she went to court, she was totally lost when the judge asked her certain questions. Clueless, because she didn't do it. I did it. That's right. <laughs> and this is Taught the... Taught me a lesson. Absolutely. Well, it comes down to, in order to be a savior, what do you want to do? You want to be the one to catch everyone fish? You're going to be catching fish all day before you feed yourself. You can teach them the fish, and then they can feed themselves, and you can feed yourself. But you don't have to feed everyone then. But if you're going to do their paper, you're, you're sitting there chucking a line and catching their fish for them. People ask me, can I do paper? No. Yes, I'm very good at paper. I'm very good at paper. You want the paper done? You sit beside me. I'll tell you what to look at. I'll tell you what to research. I'll show you how to put it down. But I ain't doing it because it's not my problem because I didn't do it in the first place and it's not my time. You know, I will volunteer my time to help your problem, but you have to do it. Many people think they're helping people when they do paperwork for them, but they're not. You're causing them more harm or loss because you're preventing them from actually doing the work themselves 
and you're actually assisting them to make themselves like like idiots in court because once they read your paper and the judge does ask them and they realize they don't know, they're going to look foolish, they're going to feel foolish, and they should. <laughs> wow. Sit down, dogs. So here's the thing. Sovereignty is a state of mind. Understanding that the consciousness is the occupant of the office, which is our body. And our conscious and mind and body together take the job as a general executor over the legal personality state. That means the consciousness has a uh, claim of right. And as, as I said on the last, last interview, our last meeting we had, if you've got a claim of right to speak and claim right for right to drive and so on, you're talking shit. You don't know what you're talking about. A claim of right is the right that your conscious has the right to claim the body it's in. That's the original claim of rights. It's an ecclesiastical document. So if you, this conscious, don't claim your vessel, you're wasting your time with any claim of rights because you don't have any. You're still behaving like a slave. If you decide you as the conscious know that you are a divine being inside and you are the one who resides in the body vessel, you're not the body. You leave the body when you die. That's why they call it a corpse. They don't bury you in the ground. They bury the vessel, the corpse. And this is the reason why their corpse has capital letters on the tombstone because it's a dead vessel. The Elvis has left the building. <laughs> yeah, the soul has left the body, so it's a corpse, and that's what they're recognised by the, the name of the deceased in capital letters. Anything in capitals is always on dead entities, and it began with corpses and tombstones. So after corpses were created, because people die all the time, when they decide to inaugurate the name of the dead. So they knew the difference. What? Hang on, this it says Gary Simon, but your name's Gary Simon. No, that's Gary Simon Senior. Yeah, and Gary Simon Senior in capitals. That's the dead one, not the living one standing in front of you. So the separation of the living and the dead is you, the living, your name is in capital letter at the front, small letters behind. That makes you the living, breathing soul. When you put capital letters behind all together, <coughs> means you a uh, corpse with a legal personality. That's known as a straw man. Now let's think of this in common sense. Has anyone in history ever heard of a corpse rising from the dead and standing up and telling anyone what to do? The answer is no. Of course not. Cor corpses are dead. They can't talk. Well, the word corpus and corporation come from the word corpse. So let's look at all these corporations. You've got government, which is a corporation. You've got the police, which is a corporation. You've got the tax, which is a corporation. Oh my gosh, everything in this system are corporation. Isn't it funny that these, all of these corporations, all of these corpses, so we're going to call it what it is, which is a corpse. We're going to take the word corporation away and we'll just leave it for the first, the corpse. So we've got the police corpse, a dead policeman. Can a dead policeman talk? No. Well, how can they tell you what to do? They can't. So how can a corporation known as a police station tell you what to do? He can't. So let's look at a politician. Can a dead politician tell you to do? No. Why not? Because it's a corpse. So a corporation known as the Australian government, can it tell you what to do? No. Why? Because a corpse can't talk. Can American government tell you? No. Why? Because it's a corporation and the corpses can't talk. What about the state government? Well, the state government, well, that's a, another corpse. Still ain't seen no corpses talk. This is how simple this stuff is. When you understand simple understanding and logic, when you start understanding the simple laws of writing, anything in capitals is dead. Any corporation is in capital letters. When you walk around tomorrow, have a look at every single corporation, every company that you walk past. I bet you it's all in capital letters because it's a dead entity. There is no spirit in the building until you walk in. No spirit in a piece of paper which corporations are made from bricks and mortar or paper. A piece of paper can't pick up a pen and write itself out. A living, breathing soul has to do it. So the only time there is spirit in a corporation is when you, me, or living entities are in there. That's the only time spirit is in. As soon as we walk out and shut the shop, it's dead again. There's no spirit in that piece of paper. There's no spirit in that, in that shop, that building, that hollow shell, the brick. There's no spirit there. So this would be the, the biggest um, mindfuck, I'll call it, without being horrible. 
is everyone has been caught in an illusion believing that because these guys wear flash badges, they got power. So what? I got badges. I got flash badges too. That means shit. And they think because the government is, is say they are who they are, they have. They don't have no power. They have power because you give them power. When you say, "Oh no, I'm too afraid," you are the one giving them power over you. They're not taking it. You are offering it to them. Why? Because you're not standing up for yourself. And if you're not standing up, it's a tacit agreement by your silence. You have agreed. It's a contract. So I can get you in a verbal contract, a written contract, or a tacit agreement. But either way, you're still agreeing. So if you don't want to agree and you don't want to be held accountable for stuff you don't do and you don't want to be judged by morons who are judging you in order to make money because a judge is a private a private contractor who's uh, doing a judgment on behalf of a private corporation and its employee. You and Nick recognizes the employee. And the corporation law is the co employee's law and they, they need to ask you all these so-called questions to see whether you broke, as an employee, broke the Corporation Act. That's why you're there. So how do you beat that? Well, if you're an employee, the first thing you should ask for is um, is not say, I'm not an employee, and so because that's what a lot of people say. I'm not an employee of you, blah, 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 blah. That's not how you play. You want to, what you want to do is you want to make them say you're not. How do you do that? What I usually say is, um, well, I'll accept that I'm an employee, but I want to know. Excuse me, Judge, who do I sue? Because since I've been 18, I haven't received the wage. I've got a tax file number for it, and all this time I've been working, when I could have been getting my money for this, who do I have to sue? Because they now have to tell me I'm not an employee. Otherwise, they've got to tell me who I've got to sue for not paying me my wage. I've never so heard you say that one before, I don't believe. Oh, well, I've got a few more for you if you want them. I've got plenty. <laughs> okay, let's play a game, all right? This is law. Every conversation you have in, under law is sexual intercourse. The only difference whether it's done with consent or no consent. That's the only difference. That's why you can whistle at a woman when she walks past and you can be, be done for sexual assault. Under law, every conversation is sexual intercourse. The only difference is if it is consent or not. So let's play a few scenarios out. You're driving a car and they pull you over. And the police come over with license and registration. Excuse me, officer. Is it illegal and unlawful to have sexual intercourse without consent? What are they going to say? Of course it is. Well, I don't consent. So now what are they going to say to you? What? Oh, you're trying to rape me now? Does that make sense? You lost me a little bit, Jagmar. Uh... Another one. <laughs> you keep these recorded, you'll love them. Do a bit of a, a bit of writing, reading on them. Here's another. Sim pulls you over and says, um, license and registration. Well, if you say nothing straight away, he's going to get you in a tacit agreement. By your silence, you've, you've just called, created a, um, a dispute. So in order not to create the dispute, you say, excuse me, officer, do I have the right to remain silent? Oh, yes, you do. I accept your contract. <laughs> I get that one. So now what can he ask you? He, you ask him a question, do I have the right? He says yes, so he's given you the right, so now you accept his contract. Thank you very much. I accept your contract. Now we can't ask you any questions because you just get, were given the right to be silent. So what are you going to ask you now? He can't. That's beautiful. I never heard that one before. That is... I've heard you ask them a question. Don't let them ask, you know, answer their questions with questions. Okay. I've never okay. heard the one that you just said. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's maximum of law. He who she who asked the, the question controls, is the one in control of the conversation or the debate. He or she who answers the question is the one who is answerable. If you want to control something, you keep the question. So when they ask you a question, they're trying to take control. They want to be the one in control. You answer with the question, you have just batted it back and you now have control. It's a battle of wits. As soon as you make an answer as a statement, you lost. He just stabbed you with the sword. Got you one point. He's got to stab you three times, get three points to control you and get a tacit agreement, verbal agreement or silence. By your silence, you agree. Yeah? Or written agreement. So here's another one for you. 
they pull you over license and registration. Then they pick your license and say, is that you? No, it's not. You're driving a car. How can that piece of plastic be in your, in your hand be you? It's not. It's an inanimate animate object. It looks like you. Yes, it is. It does look like me. But it's a two-dimensional image on a piece of paper in your hand. I'm here talking to you. And someone will be smart. So, well, I won't accept that. I won't accept that this is you. I'll say, well, I'll accept that. If I'm proof of claim, you can prove I'm not sitting here talking to you. Then I'll accept that's me. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Jagamar, one of the things that you've mentioned that always brings tears to my eyes is when you talk about the prophecy of the people setting the people free. Can that, would, would it, would, Could we shift a little bit and go into that uh, for just a little bit as a sort of the conclusion for the next 10 or 15 minutes? Yes, we can. Okay. In order to get there, you need to start from the beginning. That would be the end of days. End of days has been prophesied was the end of tyranny, end of slavery, end of all this other crap. That's also in the Akkadian prophecies, the end of days. Well, the end of days with prophecy is the, t- the days where a divine forgiveness has happened. Divine forgiveness for Lucifer, for all of the, the demons and so on. They've been forgiven of all of their sins and they have the right to enter the kingdom of God. That's simple. But before they can enter the kingdom of God, they've got to clean up the battleground. And the battleground of heavens above hell is below the battlegrounds where we are. The end of days talks about when Lucifer is set free from his, his chains and shackles from death. And he's been given the grant of being an angel again to return to the heavens to his father. But he is the last one to enter the gates until he gets all of the souls from this, this planet to, through heaven. And his first job to, in order to do that, is to banish all of those fools and idiots who are continuously trying to keep us here enslaved. His job is to wipe their names from the earth. Now, if you look at the Treaty of Lucifer, which is on the one heaven site, and you look at writs, great writs, yeah, and then you can find the great, the Treaty of Lucifer. That is the most mind-blowing document that you will find. It was done in 2009, got given to the Pope. The Pope had to take off his ring, put it on an anvil for it to be smashed, the same ring that everyone kisses. That was to release him from being the first slave to God, then he could release all of the slaves, which is all us. <coughs> Now, the second part, the end of days begun. The second part is the Valley of the Dry Bones. Valley of Dry Bones is Psalms. Yeah, from the King James Bible. Yeah. Now, Valley of Dry Bones talks about where the dead shall walk, the dead shall rise and walk again. Now, that's already happened. Once UCC filings happen and knocked out all the corporations, then all of the straw men died. We become the living again. Now, every single time we, the people, take back our escrow account and kill our straw man through the will and testament, there's only one of you now, and that's the living, breathing you. The capital letters you is now being killed, recognized by the will and testament. That's a document that I'm working on, by the way. Fabulous. You will love that document. That <laughs> document will take you free. That's one of the most powerful documents on this planet, I will say. Yeah? Yeah. Now... The third part of the prophecy, the people shall set the people free, all shall be their own saviors. What that meant is, if we look at history and time in, in past, there has been a group of people, one person who came, some say God, some say Jesus, some say um, Allah, Buddha, all this other stuff. Yep, that was the time of the past, whatever. Now is the time where there are no soldiers, saviors. In order for you to save yourself, you must be the one to claim yourself. You as a consciousness are in the body. You have to claim your body. Why? Because they claimed it. And if you don't, they own it. Why? Because you're not claiming it. So you have a responsibility to yourself because you you yourself deserve to give yourself your freedom that you want. And if you don't give yourself the freedom you want, you don't deserve it. Why? The only hands that the great creator has is our own hands. I have good hands, good arms, good legs. I'm fit enough and smart enough to go and do my own paperwork. And I'm dyslexic. I could have never been able to read and write all my life. Only in the last two years, I've taught myself to write by learning canons. By learning sovereign capacity, I've learned to write and I've learned to read. But you look at my history and you look at my biography all over the planet, all the way up to now, and you find every single biography up there on the planet states, Gary Simon is colorblind and dyslexic, blah, 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 blah. So I didn't 
I found that I wasn't that stupid and I wasn't that dumb. You're not. <laughs> because <laughs> At all. I, because the information they were trying to teach me had no relevance to me. It bored me and I couldn't couldn't keep concentration on it. And so I judged myself the way the world judged me, so I was an idiot. Until I went out of my way to learn who I really was. And when I learned who I was, then the information I was reading, I started reading. It took me two weeks before I started reading. From the very first time I picked up and started reading canons in sovereign law, it took me two weeks before I was flowing. And no one had ever taught me the all of the re, the um, rules of reading and writing and, and so on. Again, it's the stuff that I remembered. But I realized because I'm left-handed, it was actually followed in the right brain, which is divine feminine, which is the emotional side. Whereas anything on the left side, which is c- controls uh, right side of the hand, which controls the left brain, is actually cognitive thinking. So I started going, okay, if this is the divine feminine's left hand, operates the divine feminine, which is emotional side, the right side. I've been recording all of my uh, cognitive information in the in the emotional side. No wonder I've been stuffed up a bit. So I reversed it, started drawing because I also paint and so on the divine feminine side, which is the artistic side. I paint and draw and do everything with my left hand, but now I write and I do mathematics with my right hand. So all of that information are filing in the cognitive side, which is the left brain. So now I can find all the information. Now I've never been someone to do any filing and so on all my life. All my shit has been everywhere. Piles of paper everywhere. Since I started this process and using left and right brain for everything, Within the first two weeks of doing this, or first three days, I pulled all my papers out, tore my cupboards apart, and I filed every single paper I'd ever had. And I have never done that. And I'm 43 years old, and it's the very first time I have ever done this. No one had to teach it to me because it was already there, what I taught when I was, when I was young, which I took no attention of, and I was caned many times for because I couldn't understand. But after realizing what was going on, I was transferring the information that was in my left hand by doing small circles with my fingers. So I'm bringing all that information up and I was writing down with my right hand. So I'm moving from filing system here to filing system, or filing system here to filing system here by writing it here. And then when I started writing it, I started memorizing very easy because I had it in two sets of filing systems, my left and right side. So by doing this all the time, now I can start, a, um, I train myself now that I can start with my left hand write forward and then I can cross over and continue to write my right side. I can now write a sentence backwards and I can write from left side in and right side together and get to the same sentence. And I'm just, that's just something I've been practicing just to get my, my, my brain moving a bit more. I like it my brain produces move a bit more. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. When I was in, I believe it was eighth grade, I broke my arm my right arm, and I'm right-handed, and uh, the, I started doing all of my schoolwork with my le- writing with my left hand. Now, I never had written with my left hand before, and uh, I remember the first test I took, the teacher when was grading the paper and, and said, I saw this, how sloppy it was, and I put a zero on it. And then when I was recording the grades in the book, I realized it was Ron and he had a broken arm and he was writing with his left hand. So I took the time to actually decipher the, the, the scratches on the paper and he got a hundred. He was the only one in the class that got a hundred. And I did it with my left hand and I was in my right mind. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is the, this is a part of the program we've been got. They're programming our brains by getting us to use left and right hand only. That creates a war within the self. That creates a battle. Because if the left side, the, the feminine side of your brain's only been, been activated or you're only the masculine side, then the opposite side's gonna battle. Because your brain has to be even both sides. You can't have this one massive side on the left side and the, the left, the opposite side shrunken down. Because it's a muscle. <clears throat> so when you start exercising one side only, you start and you start splitting. That's why you get, whoa, temper transfer. We don't understand. Oh, this thing comes up. That's the opposite brain saying, with the only feeling there, I will force you to feed me. <laughs> you by yourself. And that's where you become, you create your own demon. So if you don't want to create your own demons, you need to start doing things left-handed and right-handed. And when the demons do come up, put your fingers together, like so, and rub them. 
make little circles. Now let's test something. Do those little circles at the same time. <coughs> now try and think about anything and get upset while you do this. But you can't. Impossible to do. Because both parts of the brain have been activated at the same time. No matter what you think about, your brain, which is the pineal gland in your head, which is the, in the emotional guidance system, is firing off energy to both, electricity to both sides of the pineal gland, left to right, which creates a triangle. And in the middle, which is your third eye, which is the pineal gland. And that's the all-seeing eye. They teach us this in, in, in uh, symbols, but people just don't break the symbols down. Now, how many monks have you seen carved monks sitting there like this with two fingers? Mm, om. Every single Chinese shop you see them, but people don't understand it. They don't know how to read symbols. Yeah? The left put the left and right together, you create a triangle. What do you think of this? Your left brain here, your right brain here. Put two, join the two, make a line. Use operating two things at the same time. Fires up both parts of pineal gland. Fires at everything evenly. You can't get upset anymore. <laughs> oh, you amaze me, my friend. I, I do have one final question. You, you've referred to your English name, but you, how did you get from using your English name, Gary Simon, to Jagamara? I'm a second degree initiated man. Um, I've been killed two times under tribal law Central Australia. Um, I was given a skin name Jagamara and by Walpi. Walpi, which is 235 kilometers northwest of Alice Springs. Um, 31 years old, my first time I was killed. 32 years old, second time I was killed. And I still got five more times to be killed. Wow. So Jagamar is actually your indigenous uh, tribal name then? That's correct. It means morning star, also snake dreaming. I've got uh, about 200 different um, dreams uh, from animal, two-legged, four-legged, winged and scared that I'm caretaker for. And all Jagamaras are caretakers. Now, <coughs> my tribal name is part of a skin system. It's like a moiety system. Now, okay. Jagamara, uh, man's name start with J, woman's name start with a two. In my in culture, we've got Jagamara, man's name, Nakamara, the woman with the same name. So her name will start with an N instead of a J. So Nakamara, and as soon as I walk through the desert, someone says, oh, what's your name? Nakamara, oh, you're my sister. Then you got Jangala, Nangala, Japojali, Napojali, uh, Jukrula, Napurula, um, Japananka, Napananka, and so on. Now, each of these names has a relationship to each other. And by you knowing that name of that person, you know how far or close your bloodline is by their name. And you know whether it's auntie, uncle, and so on within their soul system by their name. So we never have to break. Oh, I, I know you've uh, mentioned in the class today that you need to take a little bit of a break from, from the classes, but I'll tell you, I, I look forward to learning more and I, I know that you've mentioned that you're trying to get some things together to make uh, some of these teachings more available. Of course, we can go to Franco Collins' website that you've, uh, that you've mentioned. Wealth of information there. Uh, but I certainly look forward to further interaction. And I really appreciate the fact that you brought so many pieces together uh, in the freedom, whatever you call the freedom movement or the, the <laughs> our search for freedom. Uh, uh, you we you, you put the OPPT together and you, know, you bring everything in. And, mm -hmm. and I like that about what you do. Thank you. We can't be um, holding one to one set of uh, apples and saying it's only this set of apples and nothing else works. It's no good being silly. Yeah, we have no idea what technology, what paperwork, and what type of people are out there. You're only going to know that by trying it <coughs> and testing it. Some people ain't exactly. willing to test nothing until they have evidence. Well, if that's the case, no one's going to get anything done. So we say, well, our job is to step up. So I'll test technology, and I do so. I'll step up in court. I'll do whatever I need to test whatever I have to do. Because I'm not going to hand something to someone unless it's been tested first. We've got many people out there who call themselves uh, freedom fighters and so on. And they give all this paperwork that they get from the internet, but they don't test it themselves. That's where problems happen. If someone says, this is great legal advice, blah, 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 I say, don't believe, don't believe them. I say to people, don't believe what I say. Test my, my knowledge. Go out and have a look for your own, your own research to try and prove me wrong. Why? Because that's how you learn.
the only time you hear this is when I'm sitting in front, you're not learning much at all. But if you're actually going out trying to prove that I'm wrong, I know you're learning. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether they're trying to prove you're right or wrong if they're <laughs> actually investigating. The point is to get them reading. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. And, and that's what I hope to do with the people that listen to me. I want to spur them on to discover what's in them. Because it's well, in us all. Well, I'll help you out with that because um, words are the way we refine the mind and knowledge. And I became a wordsmith a while ago. So in this in this particular field. So well, I know we're going to be working very well together and we're going to do good work together. And same with everyone on the delegates. Yeah, I know this for a fact. So all I can say is I'm going to look, I'm looking forward to the journey with you and everyone else on this delegation. Because we are here because we're meant to be here. Yeah. And I love you, bro. And it's so good to speak to another, another eagle. Yeah. I know you have sat with many, um, turkeys the same as we have, but that's okay. You need to sit with the turkeys to know those who don't get off the grasses and get off the ground. Yeah. Separate from Sometimes the- Sometimes I've been a turkey myself. Hey, you have to be a turkey. How do you rest? You want, you don't, you can't relate to turkeys unless you've been one. Absolutely. Or eagles. Yep. And that's, that's what you say. If you spot it, you got it. Can't tell someone to taste the chicken unless you taste it yourself. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. It's been an interesting conversation, and I look forward to the next one, and I look forward to the continuation of uh, of your training seminars after you take this little sabbatical that you're going to take for the next couple of weeks. Thank so, you thank very much, brother. Blessings to you. Love you, mate, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.